Mike Brody, I'm so excited to have you here. And um, thank you so much for taking time to join us on Art Toolkit for a live demo of Sketchnote. And yeah. um, for braving what is a new technology for me, always exciting to, to try something new. And um, I'm really a fan of your sketchnoting philosophy of using art as a tool for visual thinking. One thing you say is ideas, not art. And at Art Toolkit, we really believe too in art as a tool, not a talent for observation and exploration, above all having fun and, and exploring the world, that idea of being an active observer. And you really promote being an active listener. So mm -hmm. I'm really excited to um, hear a little bit about your background and uh, practice some sketch noting with you. That'd be great. I love it. Well, my background is uh, I'm a designer. I was actually trained as a designer. And, and the story of sketch notes is actually pretty simple. I, uh, I encountered pain and I had to find a way around that pain. And the pain was this, that I was really good at note taking, but I hated it. And I hated it because um, I took, uh, I, I felt like I was a court reporter or something. I felt like I had to write everything down in a meeting. Um, and so I had these giant notebooks. I had a pencil in case I made mistakes. And I would write everything down in the meeting. And I, and I almost was not present in the meeting to some degree because I was so busy doing writing, like capturing. And then the worst part of it was I would get done and have this massive pile of notes, pages and pages. And then I like, had no desire to go in and find any kind of value in the notes because it was too much work. So like all that work kind of felt like a waste and it, it was stressful and it was a burden really. And so I, I made this decision that I needed to change something. This is late 2006 into early 2007. I said, you know, as a designer, I'm always faced with limitations of all kinds, limited colors. You have to use this logo, like you name it, there's limitations, sort of the name of the game for a designer. I said, what would happen if I put limitations on myself? <laughs> and so what I did is I made, uh, I just, I'm an experimenter. I like to experiment and try things out. It sounds like you are too. Oh, I love it. <laughs> so um, I had a conference coming up, a design conference. Uh, I live in Milwaukee and Chicago is about a train ride away. So I said, you know what? I'm going to this conference. What if I change my, my normal routine up? I leave my big book at home, leave my pencil at home. I had purchased a moleskin uh, notebook, beautiful notebook, and was afraid to use it because it was so beautiful. I said, I'm going to use that notebook. It's been sitting there for months. And uh, the opposite of the pencil was a gel pen. At the time, I was really into Pilot G2 pens, which are really nice and smooth, have real dark black ink. Mm -hmm. So my limitation is I have to use this pocket moleskin, so it's small, and I have to use this black gel pen. And um, the reason I chose those tools were, well, they were handy, but the pocket moleskin had small pages, and it reinforced to me that my job is not to write everything down. It's to capture the important things. And then the pen reinforced that further because what I put on the page stayed on the page. I couldn't erase it or I had, no, I had no way out. So I had to really contemplate and think about what is it that's worth putting on the page. And so what happened was when I went to the conference, suddenly I was um, making a lot more decisions and analysis in the moment in my mind about what was interesting or important or making connections and then capturing that on the page. And oddly enough, it felt like it felt so relaxing to me because before I was just like writing, 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 writing. And now I could like actually relax and think about what the speaker was saying and make the connections uh, about whatever ideas were being presented and then capture them on the page. And suddenly I had free time to do lettering, which I love, and then drawing little images that, I, that were popping in my head or might appear on the presentation and I had so much fun in that first experiment that I knew I had to keep going. <laughs> um, the other dynamic that was real interesting, this is 2007. So Twitter had like just started. It was like, nobody knew what Twitter was or why you would do it. Um, but Flickr was really popular at the time and it was relatively active you know, for, us, for that time. Um, and so I started posting the pages. There was only about eight pages. You still, you can still find them on my Flickr account. And I posted them on Flickr and mentioned a few of the speakers and they really loved them. But the really interesting thing that happened was the people who um, didn't attend the event were actually saying, these are really helpful. I can see 
what was presented. If this thing comes to my town, then I might go check it out. And I'm, I got value from the notes you took, even though my intention was never to share them with anyone else. It was really for my own benefit. But I realized that there was something about that compression of ideas on the page that was really valuable to not only me, but other people. And that's where I thought, okay, if I had that much of a problem and I've found a solution, there's, there have to be other people like me who could use this idea. So then I started to practice and push it more. And that led to eventually writing the book, the Sketchnote Handbook, after many years of practice and sharing. Because again, the next level was, okay, if this is really a problem for other people, then I need to share that in, a, in the most broad way possible, which a book just made sense. And then we just had, my editor and I had just a blast doing a really funky book with orange and black and rounded colors and weird paper. And we oh, it's kind so of, cool. I love it. sort of like push the boundaries. I grew up as a comic book fan. So uh -huh. a lot of, you could feel like comic book uh, DNA in that thing and yeah, you know, yeah. designer. So I was really fortunate that we had the control over the book that I would, did everything from writing the text to the production. So I actually handed the files to the printer to be produced because I was an old print designer. So I had that benefit. I had really control of every aspect of the book, which I think makes it kind of unique. So that was, so that's sort of the story um, of sketchnoting. And I'm still a designer. I still do that full time. And sketchnoting is something I do uh, because I just love to do it. I love seeing people light up when they realize they can, they can draw. And so one of the things we're going to do today is sort of explain one of the key parts of the book, which is the five basic elements of drawing. Because there's I, over and over again, when I, when I present either online or back when I did it in person, there were so many people who felt like I can't draw, so I can't sketch note, full stop, right? Yeah. So I knew I had to get past that, even as far back as when the book started being organized. Like if I can't convince people they can at least make marks on paper that make sense, I'm not going to sell many books, right? So it was, it was you know, my own uh, needs, but also trying to get people to the, to the goal, right? So, yeah. So you know, that's where I focus on this idea of five basic elements, and it's a simple way to um, think of drawing as using Legos, almost. Is a, some ways I'll describe it that way. That makes it easier for someone to approach drawing who doesn't really have that. You know, they just don't know where to start. It gives them something to start with. It's containable, it's rememberable, and it makes sense once they start to practice. So if someone's watching right now and is kind of curious about this, we're going to switch in a minute to the camera on my desk. I'm going to do some drawing. And I would love for you to grab a pen and a notebook or paper or whatever you have around and follow along because I think you'll see that it's actually pretty easy to do. And if anyone has any questions and wanna, wants to pop those in the chat, I'll keep an eye on that and I'll um, do our best to, to get to everything. And Mike, I love so much everything you shared just about art being accessible and that using that visual note-taking really helps you remember things more vividly mm -hmm. and share the story with others. And I, uh, I pulled these out as we were chatting a little before and thought I might share a little with others is, you know, th these are some notes from my, when I was in high school and, and uh, doing storytelling for a class where cool. it was just, it's how I've always liked to think is with yeah. like words and pictures. And I really love that you create a system for it because often it can feel intimidating, the art with a capital A and diving in. And one of my mantras personally is trust in process. And so sometimes if you've got a process that you can follow, it gives you that kind of activation to get into the flow. And I love that that's something you provide and, and I'm really excited to, to cover some of the basics today. Great, great, this is, that's a fantastic. Um, well, you want to jump to uh, your screen here? Yeah, let's switch over to the screen. I'm going to share my screen here for you all. Hopefully it will we'll share properly. Let me know once you see that thing. It looks great. So I've got the schedule here. These are This is sort of what I want to cover in our little time together. And it's uh, We've sort of done the introduction so we can, I love checking things off that are done, right? Um, and it's that so we're gonna satisfying. Do, we're going to do the five basic elements of drawing that I mentioned. We're going to show you two ways to draw people that are a little bit more interesting than stick people. There's nothing wrong with stick people, but I think I've got better people that give you some more latitude if you need it. We're going to talk about the seven sketchnote layouts. And this is basically when I wrote the book, I started to observe, you know, I was doing all this research, like, you know what? It's interesting. The 
the sketch notes I see tend to fall in about seven different structures. So I should probably document that. So we'll talk a little bit about that and where each one of those layouts is strong and maybe where it's weak. And then finally, we'll have some time at the end for some Q&A. So I'll pull my sticky note off my page here and we'll get started. Awesome. Love your All colors right, so, there too. So bold. <laughs> so the first thing we're going to talk about are the five basic elements of drawing. And this is actually derived from a few other visual thinkers that I have hung out with. And uh, several other people have, uh, I guess you call them like a library or a language or something. I sort of boiled it down to five. Others have more. I just kind of felt like you only really needed five. I already made a, a, a typo, look at that. Drawing. So the five basic elements is this, square, circle, a triangle, a line, and a dot. So I'll go ahead and put the words there. I'm really a big believer too in words and pictures together help each other and support <laughs> each other. One of my teacher friends from an elementary school said years ago that they say a teacher, or excuse me, they say a picture is worth a thousand words, but it helps to write down some of those words. Right. I just think that, you know, sometimes um, if your drawing is not exactly what you want it to be, um, the words can sort of support it a little bit and vice versa. All right, so these are the five elements. Um, and the reason I chose five is it's easy to remember and that you can stretch these into other things. So, you know, squares can be rectangles, circles can be ovals. And honestly, if you really think about it, all of these are basically dots you know, in an or a certain order. So if you really wanted to say the one element of drawing is a dot, but that that's a little harder sell. So the way I want to demonstrate this is um, I'll do the word first. So I always start with something really simple. So let's start with house. So if you were to draw a house, how would you do that? Well, I would say you start with a square like this and draw a triangle on top of it. And again, it doesn't have to be real perfect. And like we talked about, the two work together. So if you can't, if it's really messy, the house sort of backs it up a little bit. So that would be like the bare minimum. So one of the things I, the one thing I like about this is it almost feels like you're playing a game with the five basic elements. The game is this, how few objects can I use to communicate an idea? That's kind of a fun game to sometimes play. So this would qualify as a house and I've only drawn two elements. However, we can add more detail. So what if we put a rectangle in the square, now we have a door. I can use a line here, and now I've got a window on the door. Mm -hmm. a dot, and I've got a doorknob. I can put a square up in the attic here, and now I've got a, a you know window in the attic. And then finally, I can do a rectangle on the roof, and I've got a chimney. And then the last thing we can do is take the line, and maybe you do it squiggly instead of straight. And now you've got a little smoke coming out of the chimney. All about so simplifying. You can just start really simple and add as you need. So with the beauty of that is, if you can get away with a couple of objects, you can move on. And then at the end, when you come back, you can fill in the detail. So what's nice is you can do it in the moment if the, if the speaker is droning on, or you can <laughs> come back later when you're sort of touching up and looking for typos and all that kind of stuff. So here's another one. What about book? So the word book, I would say, Probably the simplest I could do that would get away with it would be a, a rectangle with a line down the middle, right? So the interesting thing about our minds is we fill in all kinds of detail and gaps on things, which is a huge advantage for us, right? If something is not quite all the way there, our mind will fill in the rest because it likes completion and it's also recognizing patterns. So just like with the house, even though that's about as simple as you can get away with, we can add more detail. So here's another little trick draw a line along the bottom here and then connect it up. What we've done is we've uh, suggested to our minds that there is depth to the book. It looks like, it could look like pages, right? There's a suggestion of depth. If I had a gray marker and I hit this, that would even further reinforce that there's shadow there, but it's really quite simple. It's two dimensional. There is no dimensionality. And then um, for a book, well, of course it has text on the pages. Well, what if we just use lines? We can represent that text as lines. Maybe on the right page, it's a picture book. We can put a square there. 
Maybe it's a picture of a mountain, so I can use my triangle. And then I'll finish with two more lines. So you can see we started with the most simple of objects and now we've added some detail. And if you had more space, you could add plenty more detail if you wanted to, right? So the third one I wanna show you is coffee. And there's a specific reason why I do this. I, well, I love coffee, but um, so when you see coffee, you might be tempted to think, oh, I need to do, do perspective and circles and I never do perspective, right? That's like, my, my argument is why go three-dimensional when you don't need to? What about the side view of a coffee cup? Let's do a little, make these the stacking kind of coffee cups. And then a handle. So we'll use a half circle or oval and connect it. And that represents coffee. You can maybe suggest this hot coffee with some of those same lines that we used on the house to suggest vapor. And if you're, um, you know, Marie, I think you're a tea drinker. You could just change the word to tea. <laughs> and now it's a cup of hot tea, right? So it's really super flexible. It's very simple. It's sort of, like I said, it's the game is how few lines or objects can I draw on the page to achieve the concept? That's kind of fun. And I think um, if you start to get into this, one of the things that you realize is that um, you start to build a visual library of these objects, the more you draw them. And there can be a benefit if you know you're gonna use certain icons over and over again, to spend some time instead of going on Facebook and being jealous of people to sit down and make a list of words and draw icons from them and build your own little library that you can repeat over and over again. So when you get into a situation and you see that word, boop, an image comes right in your head because you practiced. Now I will give you one other, one other resource called the noun project. Oh, I love the noun project. Oh, That's yeah. great. So I think it's noun project that Com. Yeah. What's interesting about this service is um, there's a free version of this and there's a paid version that gives you more, lets you download icons, it, but it's basically an icon search uh, website. So you go to this website, it's got a search thing. You type in any word you can think of, pretty much any word, they, they will have an icon or like maybe a hundred icons for that thing. So if you get stuck, like you have a word, you're trying to find uh, an icon for it, go here, look for it and see what inspiration comes to you. And then I would say the other alternative is just good old google.com. I'm having trouble spelling today. Google.com and do a search for the topic and then click on image search, the, the image tab. And you'll see all kinds of images and you get all kinds of inspiration for ways to think about that word that gives you, you know, some ideas for how you can draw it. And then you simplify what you see down to a simple icon. So, um, so that's the five basic elements of drawing. Um, and if you know, think what I'll do is I'll slide the page up and I'll do three more. So let's see, I want to do pizza. Let's do and Mike, chat. I'm noticing you're using pens as well yeah. um, versus pencil. And you're not, you're not agonizing yep. over your marks or, or worrying over them too much. No, like, you know, you see that I'm not real worried about mistakes. So one solution, so if I was looking at this as uh, if I was doing this and I made a mistake like this, probably what I would do is come back here and bold all the other letters so that this suddenly doesn't stand out anymore. So I'm always, because I'm an old print designer, I'm always looking for ways that I can solve a problem. So, you know, now I, if I went back and reflected like the space here is a little bit tight, I probably could have moved it down, but it doesn't matter. It's, you know, I'm communicating an idea. If you're following along, you don't care that it's close, like maybe from a designer's perspective, you know, I could have given more space, but maybe nobody else would think that. And I, I kind of like the other thing you'll see is I'm using two colors. So, right, I've got a, a black and a teal. Teal is one of my favorite colors. And it, I, I really like this contrast that's going on. One's a little bit darker, one's a little bit lighter, and they sort of set off and you can have, you can play a little bit with those two colors. Um, so I think the third one I'll do is, um, what would be a third one to do? Pizza chat and submarine, how about that? My, my eight-year-old son is really fascinated with uh, the Beatles' Yellow Submarine song. So that's an honor of my son. So pizza, now you might be really tempted if you're doing a slice of pizza to just do a regular triangle, but I would recommend you put a little bit of curve on that line and then you can match it. So you just do a parallel line next to it. 
and now you've got a piece of pizza. The reason I suggest that it's really coming out of a circular thing, right? So if you think of it, it's extending off into space that, of the pizza you took it from. The same thing you can do with, um, so if you want to re further reinforce pizza, have the pepperoni, some of them kind of go off because again, the other part is on, you know, somebody else's slice. Now, the last thing you can do is just like we did on the book, add a little bit of depth here, just a line on the bottom. And now it suddenly has a feeling, you know, that it's um, got some depth to it, even though there's no shading and shading would certainly reinforce that, right? Um, maybe in this one, we fill in the pepperoni. So it just stands out a little bit more, All right? So there's pizza. So chat, um, I think of these little speech bubbles. So I would sort of do almost a rounded rectangle. So I'm taking the rectangle and just putting round edges on it. And then I do the speech pointer. I don't know what that's called, this direction. Again, just like with the book, just a couple of lines to represent, you know, text or speaking. And then next to it, rather than just putting another one right here, what if you overlap it? So you just start drawing next to this, do your rounded rectangle, sort of set it a little bit lower. And then the pointer goes in the other direction. What's kind of cool about this, a couple things. Well, you've, you've got an overlap, so you see there's some connectivity and there's a discussion going on. The other interesting thing is you don't really need people here because it's implied by the little pointers. If you understand comic uh, balloons, these are speech balloons, right? That obviously someone's saying it, even though you don't see it. And this is present in, I think, every kind of smartphone, Android or iOS sort of follows a paradigm kind of like this, right? So it's a really quick way to kind of simply communicate that idea. And I mean, half the fun of it is maybe sitting down and drawing it a bunch of different ways until you, oh, this is the perfect way to draw that. And then the last one I'll do is submarine. So I would say for this one, let's do kind of a stretched out oval, half oval, <laughs> half rectangle. So you've got the body of the sub. You've got a, a little rectangle here for, I think they call that the conning tower. And that's where your periscope pops out. I think if you had the periscope out, you probably would be above the water line so we can draw the water line. And you can see that, you know, the style that I'm doing is very cartoony, right? It's, there's not much detail here. Real submarines probably have a more defined shape than this, but it communicates as a submarine. So why, why go into that detail? We'll put a, a couple of ovals here and maybe a corkscrew shape to suggest it's spinning through the water. And then my, maybe finally we'll, you know, put a little, a little slot here, that's your torpedo tube. And now we've got a little torpedo shooting at the- <laughs> I think you and out. your son have spent some time looking at submarines. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what's really interesting about this is, again, as I said, over time, you start ending up with a visual library. And that is the things that you can pull, like I'm pulling these just from memory, right? Because I've done them quite a bit. Make sure I spelled this right. Uh, but you can also just like this, if you get a notebook, you could just sit there with a list of words. Your favorite words are words used often, like in business or when whatever environment you want to use them in. And then you can build this collection of icons that you can refer to. Maybe you keep them in the back page of your notebook, right? And you can refer to them right in the same notebook you're going to do sketching in. So that's the concept of five basic elements of drawing and uh, the visual library which is, you know, that's what you end up building over time if you continue to extend this concept. So- oh, um, Beautiful, Mike. And it, it's grounded in, in so much of art of simplifying, looking for those big shapes and just playing the yeah. game of how simple you can go and having fun with it. So what's really fascinating about this is um, my little, he's now eight years, eight years old. I was presenting this to some adults, a small adult group. And he was sitting with my wife in the corner because there was nothing else to do. We were at a camp or something. And um, she gave him some of the pens and paper that we had for everyone else. And he was doing something. I was focused on presenting. And when I got done, he came over and showed me and he did exactly everything I said to do. Like he followed me. He was seven years old at the time. And he was more than capable of doing everything that I've done right here. I was like, wow, that's really cool. Like this really does translate to kids. So kids really think this way. It makes it approachable for kids. And I think for a lot of adults who maybe stopped drawing because of the baggage of drawing when they were in middle school or grade school, that this is a pathway back into it. And I would say the 
probably the most important thing about this that I see is confidence. Now it might be just a little bit, but um, even in a half hour workshop that I've taught, confidence is the most important thing that I see coming out of it. And people are really excited because they feel like they walked in the door thinking they couldn't draw and they walked Mike, out. I just the lost your audio. Did you? How about that? Am I back again? Yes. Okay. All right. Sounds good. So um, the, the most important thing I've noticed when teaching this is the confidence level. Like you would come in, you know, not knowing how to draw, feeling like you couldn't draw. And then, you know, 30 minutes later, you would be able to draw. And that was really exciting for so many people who felt like drawing was something that they just couldn't do anymore. So that's really exciting. This is, this is the whole reason I do it is helping people to see that they have the capability to do more drawing and um, visualization than they may realize because we're really super visual people. All right, so I'm gonna come back up. Let's bring up my little post-it note. I wanna check off my little five basic elements. We covered that. Now we're gonna talk about drawing people. So let's move to this other page. So the interesting thing is, uh, of course you can draw Stick people, everybody probably knows how to do this, right? You can just do a stick person or whatever you might call it. Um, and it's fine. I think that's a reasonable way to represent people. However, I can show you two other ways to draw people that have some advantages. The first one is what I call the Dave Gray method because my friend Dave Gray kind of came up with this or popularized it, I guess you would say. The interesting thing about the Dave Gray method is he starts with a rectangle for the body. And then he simply hangs the legs and the arms off of the rectangle. And then the hands can almost be like little Lego hands, really super simple. And then finally a little line for the neck and a head. So what's interesting about this is now you have a, almost a canvas you can work with. So let me draw a little bit bigger person so I can show some details. So let's make them just a little bit bigger. Same kind of person. Little neck and a head. So what's interesting about this, what if I wanna make this a Wall Street businessman? I don't know why I would wanna do that, but now I can draw a little tie. I have a canvas, you can't do that on a stick person. You can also draw a line here and suggest that they have pants on, right? Now we can make it a happy businessman. Right, and um, the suggestion here, there's a couple of ways to do a nose on this face. So you could do just a simple line like this. The beauty of the line is uh, line sort of suggests direction. So you can actually make the person looking in a certain direction. Another option could be a little half triangle like this. Right, so you can do that. There's a bunch of different ways you can uh, amplify it, but once you have that basic symbol down, you can you can build people really fast. So I like You're it. So expressive it's too. I love yeah. I love the, what you what you've communicated in so few lines. So what's kind of cool too is if you need to do some, you can have these after you start practicing, you can make these people doing things. So as an example, here's somebody running. So Dave always says, start with the legs first, because the legs say a lot more about the body than the arms do, which is interesting. So here's the right. So maybe he's running away from a bear, right? He's looking back behind him. So that's where the little line could come in handy. Maybe you even um, draw a little line underneath him. So it suggests there's a shadow, so he's running, right? And the kind of cool thing about this is you can kind of twist them in all kinds of different different directions. So that's the Dave Gray method of doing people. The other one is called a star person. This is really popular with my cousins in the graphic recording, graphic facilitation space. So you, if you've ever seen someone in the front of a room with a big four by eight sheet of board or paper drawing in front of the room. That is a graphic recorder or potentially a graphic facilitator if they are running the meeting. It's uh, sort of a cousin to sketch noting. Sketch noting is a little more personal. The scale is smaller like this. Uh, graphic recording and facilitation are large scale, try to be neutral, 
often like a facilitator will actually manage the room and sort of get people to talk. So lot, uh, quite, an, quite, a, quite a skill to, to have. So the star person is something that they use a lot. And this one starts with the circle for the head first. And the idea is that you're building basically like a star you did in junior high school with a head on top. But you can stretch these arms in different ways. So let's, I'll show you what I mean. So I would start here and draw down. There's the first arm of the star, the second, sort of come up, the third, and the fourth. And you can see it's almost a single, it's like a circle in a single line, and you can produce a person. And just like with the, with the Dave Gray method, you've got some canvas here to work with, right? So I can, in the same way, make this a person, maybe it's a playing sports, right? So you put a number on their chest, now they can be a teammate. And you can do other things too. You can have, give them shoes, you, know, you can put a baseball hat on them or something like that, right? So there's all kinds of flexibility. You can also stretch the star person out, and make them really tall, like a NBA player or something, or a giant. And uh, my friend, Michael Clayton came up with this guy in one of our workshops we did as a team teaching team. See how long it takes for you to pick up what this is. <laughs> that's a sumo wrestler. A little star man. <laughs> it's a little bit twisted to the side, but that's okay. So that those are two simple ways to drop people. They're not much more work than the, than a stick person, but yet you get the benefit of this canvas to draw on, right? To give them body and feeling. It's got a little bit more, you know, something to them, right? So that's, those are two options that you can use for the work you're doing. So let's go back to our schedule. We finish Do you have a, a favorite approach with people or you find it just depends on the topic and what you're, what you're feeling that day? I tend to lean on the Dave Gray method. I think it's just because I learned this first. So sometimes, you know, you just do the thing you've learned first without any good reason other than that. So um, I think I just use this once in a while, I'll pull this out, but I, I like to teach it because having two options is really great because someone might really resonate with this and like, oh, that's, that's totally cool. Like it's almost like a stick person, but with body, someone else might really love the look and feel of this person. And that's sort of the, their thing. So it's kind of nice to have a couple of options uh, that you can work from. So our last topic we're going to talk about is uh, our seven sketch note layouts. And again, this is when I started doing research for the book, looking at tons of sketch notes, I started to see, I mean, there were more than seven, but there were seven core layouts that I kept seeing over and over again. And I've actually drawn these out ahead of time so we can talk a little bit about them. So let's get those up on screen so you can see. All right. So we'll talk through each one and I'll explain sort of the, the pros and cons of each. So the first one is linear. So linear relies almost uh, exclusively on book format. You know, just like any book you read in the West, I guess in the East, it probably is a little different because they read right to left, right? So, but the book format, you start at the top of the page, you go to the bottom, top of the page, bottom. This, what I'm doing here is a linear format, right? I've started at the top, I go down, same kind of way. So that's a linear format. And um, I would say that this one, is uh, easy to start with because it's kind of what you're doing now, right? There's not much change. When I get into a situation where I'm sketchnoting some complex information, I will fall back on the linear. And the reason I do that is because it's like my default. I don't have to think about it. It's just burned into my memory. I could just do it without thinking. And I'm a real big believer in taking cognitive load away when you're under stress, because it's just another thing. You talked about following the process. It's another way to, to build process into your work that sort of takes away the stress. So if I have, if I know what my pens are, I know my page size, I know my format. Now all I have to do is focus on the content and I don't have to worry as much about how, how will I lay it out? How will I fit things, right? This can be a really good default that you can start with. The second one um, is called radial. And you might see this also as a, a mind map. It's a really good way to, re to uh, recognize it. And the idea is that the center portion, 
right here is where you put the maybe the title of the content that you're talking about description it doesn't have to be big but it's you know in the center it doesn't even have to be in the center you can move it to different parts and then have radiating information so that's where your title your main information would be and then each one of these little nodes would have sub information and you can do it um, like you could say just like a clock maybe you start here and you come around to the top right so this would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And they don't have to be so rigid. Like you can just put stuff in this area. And one of the things I teach is to build yourself templates that you can slide under your pages that have a radial structure that give you the guidance, or you can do it with pencil on the page and then erase it. And then you just sort of build your information with that as almost like a foundation or almost like when you're in school, you have lines on the page of your book to help you write in straight lines, right? It sort of gives you some structure. So radial is really good for uh, any kind of topic that has relatively equal information that you can spread out in this way. And you, the kind of cool thing is you can see each element for its own uh, weight, but then you can see it also as a whole and how it relates to the middle. And you can make it as complex as you want, like a mind map, if you've got the space. Um, so that's the radial format. Probably the disadvantage of radial is um, it, uh, the space is a little bit more broken up. Um, it might be hard to know like which one of these, unless you clearly say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, which one of these do I start with? Maybe the information you're representing, it doesn't matter which one you start with. Maybe all of them are equally valid, right? Here's the core idea. And then these are all the things that sprout from it. So um, that may not be a limitation at all. So the third one is called vertical. Now this is especially useful. You notice that my shape is a little taller and narrower. Um, this could be really helpful for like a scroll, like if you did a scroll of paper like this. And basically it's just the information just continues going down in a straight path right around, right? This can be helpful for tall, long pages. Um, and it's like, a, in some ways it's like a single page of the linear expressed in a, you know, in a vertical way. So just another way to think of the information. You're sort of starting at the top and you're going straight down. And this can be, you know, interesting um, when you're trying to capture maybe a story or something like that. You could sort of have images along the way. Text sort of anchors the middle and then you've got images to support it along the way. That could be one way to do that. So that's another interesting option. A uh, path is something you might see quite a bit, and it's um, this can also be numbered. So you could start one, two, three, four, five, six, right? So it could be a certain order, maybe steps along a path. Um, you know, stories are all you could think of as a path. Like you, Luke Skywalker begins in one way, and all this conflict happens, and he comes out at the other end as a hero, right? So um, this is really interesting if you've got a clear uh, storyline. Reminds me of a board game too, just seeing that little picture, right. thinking about the paths we take. Yeah, yeah. So I think if you have a really clear story or path uh, that you're trying to convey, this can be really helpful in giving you structure to show that, where maybe some of the others are, you know, less suited to that. Uh, the next one is modular. And this would be like, maybe I put the headline in here and then there would be little tidbits of information in each one of these modules. And it can be expressed in a bunch of different ways. It doesn't have to be a grid. In some ways, it's sort of relate, it's sort of tied a little bit to radial. It's just um, represented in a different way. Instead of having the central thing, you're putting that up here in the header. And then these objects around the edge are put into modules. But it gives you some structure to work with. And this can be really, really helpful for, again, sort of a general idea and then the different ways it may be expressed or uh, six different people's opinion of that concept or something like that. The next one is called Skyscraper. And the, the real strong benefit of this is if I am doing a panel of multiple people, so maybe there's three people, it can be really hard when there's three or more people saying different things to keep up and make keep track of what's happening. So the way I would use the skyscraper is I would ahead of time build sort of, you know, with maybe pencil, the structured areas where they're going to appear. Maybe I would spend some time doing a little, you know, drawing of each person, put their names above them. And as they say something, oh, that's really interesting. Oh, this person said something. I'm going to put something there. This person said something. 
Maybe I leave a little space. Oh, they said something. Then them. Then them. They sent something else, right? And you can go down the page and fill it in. And, you, and you've got structure in place. So no matter who's talking, you just put it in the right uh, column of the skyscraper and you're all set. And then if you need to, you could just flip to another page and keep on going. If it's a long discussion and you have several people, you could sort of maybe plan ahead and say, okay, this is about an hour. These people are talkative. Maybe I need two or three of these pages ready to go. And you could just continue to, to build what they're saying. And then you can sort of afterwards that allows someone to follow that person's train of thinking. And the cool thing too, is you can even like, if something's connected, maybe you can with a light color connect. Oh, these, these ideas are connected. Those ideas are connected. Those kind of things can maybe happen if you see that happening. So that's really good for panel discussions. Like uh, South by Southwest is really common for its panel discussions. Really, really hard to keep track of what five people are saying. This can help you. And then finally, popcorn is probably the most random. This is where stuff really doesn't have a structure. It's just allowed to sort of fill the space. I would say um, this is great if you just want to capture information fast. You're not really worried about structure. Maybe you would even take your notes in this format and maybe decide later. Actually, there's a story here. Let's make that into a path. Maybe you would do it again and redo it as path. Or it could just stay this way. Um, so the popcorn has a lot of flexibility and it's fast, but it's also confusing. So for somebody else to see what that means uh, could be a challenge, right? So maybe if you start to get a little crazy, it could be not the best thing for someone else to draw meaning from. And then the, probably the other thing to watch out for here is white space. Because if you're going crazy and you fill up with information, it can make it a real burden for someone else besides you to process the information. So you lose structure, but it provides you a quick way to capture. So each one of these have a little bit of a benefit to them. And some are more popular than others, but those are the seven sketchnote types that um, I've identified as a good starting place. And you know, there's hybrids of these and other ones as well. Oh, Do you have any these are about that, Maria? These are so cool. You, you've covered so much in, in such a short amount of time. I do have some questions, a few from myself and Good. a few from our, um, our viewers. Okay. And um, one question I have and um, people have been asking is like tips with lettering. I know you do cover mm. this in your book. So I'm going to encourage everyone to, yeah. to check out your book too, because you've got such clean, bold lettering and um if you have any sort of tips there or, you know, just want to point us, point us towards some things to, to dive deeper into that. Let's do a little bit, a little tutorial on lettering. It's interesting because I've started moving into this uh, video stuff myself and spent a few months planning and organizing a whole um, workshop on lettering where I teach sort of my techniques. It's about a two hour workshop and I sell the recording. So if you're really into this and you want to see that, it's like 15 bucks. So we can give you the link to that but I'll give you the, the basics to kind of give you the concept. So um, the thing that I think about lettering is to slow down. That's your first thing is slow down as much as you can. Because I think when I notice when I make messy letters, it's because I'm going too fast. So um, the first one I'll show you is called two line lettering. So I would assume that you can write, you know, single line like this pretty straightforward. Uh, Two-line lettering is where you do this. I'm going to do your name, Maria. So you start with a single line like so. Notice that I'm leaving just a little space between each of the letters. That gives me some latitude to make them bold. So you can, if you can do single line lettering, that's pretty standard. But sometimes you want to emphasize, what if I want to give you a, uh, a headline or title? What I would do is come in and just draw a parallel line next to the line that I just drew. The beauty of this is, um, you know, I, we could teach you how to do it like this, but you have to have lots of control and practice to do a letter like this. And even then it's not perfect. And ultimately, if I'm gonna fill this in, who cares what the frame looks like? You're really just building yourself an easy template. So you can see there, I've just, all I have to do is match the other line. I think I'll draw the line on the outside here because I don't want this to get all plugged up. And then the line under here for the A. 
So I left a little space here. I think because this is hanging over, I'll put the line on the outside of the R. Do that here. And then for this one, I'll be careful. See, notice how I sort of went a little closer to the stroke. I'm going to put a little line here because I want to make sure the R here stays open. I think I'm going to put the line on the left side. And then for the A, I'll put again these on the outside. Now this one, I might have to tweak it a little bit. Like the bottom strokes of the A are a little bit short. So I'm kind of always looking and sort of figuring out. And it looks like maybe I left a little space here. So maybe I can tweak it. So the beauty of this is because you're doing a template, you can sort of modify it. You can still have uh, some capability to modify. So the next thing I'll do is I'll kind of close off the ends. That eye can definitely be thicker. And I think the other thing too is when you come in here and you start filling in the letters, you can start seeing it starts getting bold. Now I'm taking my time, I'm going pretty slow. A lot of times I would go pretty quickly in filling these in. But I just want to okay, make sure that comes together. Yeah, so you just fill that in. Now the thing about it is, is you fill it in and you sort of look at it and see like, what does it need and what's missing? So once I fill it in, I'll say, okay, I'm gonna look at this. There's a little notch right there. Um, this A looks pretty good. It looks like my R got a little tight in here, but that's okay. Um, this, this R strokes a little high. Maybe I'll try to stretch it a little bit. The I here could be a little bit bolder and I've got too much space here, just a little bit. So I'm gonna make it bolder on that side. And then this A looks pretty good. Like maybe I would just extend the bottoms a little. So let's go ahead and do that. So I'm gonna fix my little notch. I kind of like leaving the little white marks in there. It kind of gives it a human feel. The other thing I like is if it's imperfect, like if I didn't do this quite right, like that just says it wasn't a machine that made it. <laughs> so I'll fix that. Now here, this is where I feel like on the right side, this could be thicker and I've got some room to work with. So now you can really see like this R is almost touching the eye and here there's space. So maybe the next time I do this, I'll plan like, okay, I remember that that was close. I better move the eye over a little bit because I can't take up the ink now, right? And then I just look at this, maybe I would extend, just add a little bit of thickness to the bottom just to kind of equal it, equal it out. So that's the two line method. And then the three line method is similar. I'll just do a single letter to demonstrate that. So let's do just the letter H. I like using H when I demonstrate this. So the thing about two lines is it consumes a lot more space. You have to plan a little bit more for it. Just like before, we have a parallel line. So this one looks like it's running uphill a little bit. So I tried to straighten this one a little bit. And then three line, then you'd come on the other side and you add another line parallel on the opposite side. Now this one, remember this is going uphill. So you'll see me compensate for that a little bit because ultimately I'm going to fill it in and you won't even know that there was a crooked line. Now I cap these, I try to make them about equal. Do the same here. And then I fill it in. And like I said, if, if it's got little specks or something, I kind of like leaving those in there. It gives it a little bit of a human touch. I, I love that there's a framework to that letter. Yeah, it's sort of like you're building your own framework and then you cover it up so nobody knows it's there. And then when you're done, you sort of look for like, oh, I could probably just little optical illusions. I want to tighten that up. See, I took that little, there's a little hook there. I just took that away. Maybe I'll touch some of these weight and then I'll leave them there. And you can see like there, even though that line was kind of going uphill, it's hidden now because we, we compensated on the top side. And I mean, if you want to get nerdy, you could use a little ruler and make these perfect. I just don't, I think it's a lot of time spent to not really improve the, I just like the human feel of it. I think. Yeah. You're not a machine. Um, right. And Mike, can you tell us about some of the supplies you're using? I, um, sure. And, you know, I love that you're using color. I do wonder if you ever incorporate watercolor. Um, and uh -huh. I know I sent you to play with, and I hope you enjoy um, a pocket palette with some sample paints and a water brush. That's something, you know, I use a lot um, yes. to fill in little simple things. And I love your pens. I'm curious to know what kind of pens you're using yes. these days. So I'm gonna go uh, around the page. So let's go back up to the top. Um, so this is a company in Germany called Neuland. Really awesome. It's a small family company. Um, and what's interesting about all their markers is they're designed, they're designed for graphic recorders and facilitators, but they've realized that they're sketch noters and other people out there. And so they now offer these. This is a permanent marker with pigment ink. 
So if I drop water on this page, the ink will not bleed away. Now it's got a very bold, I guess you can see the tip, a pointed tip. So I mean, I can get, I can do some relatively fine lines with it if I'm under control, or I can really lay some thick ink on there. And it is really dense. Like, I, I don't know if you can see it on YouTube or not, but this is the pigment in here is so dense. So two cool things about all their markers is if the nib gets busted up because it's felt, you just pull it out and stick a new one in there and they sell those. And then they have a little uh, hole in the back here. You can buy ink and fill that up again. So when the pigment runs out, you just fill up your bulb and squirt it back in there and you're ready to go. So it's kind of like a lifetime tool. So that's the, this is called, uh, I think it's uh, no, the big one, the outliner. So the outliner has a certain kind of ink. There is a smaller version of it like this that comes in um, bullet nib. And you see they've got indicators for all the different aspects of what the pen does. So this is the bullet nib. So it's just a, a little smaller version of the same thing, same ink. Maybe I'll put them up on the page so you can see. Uh, this one is, uh, this is not permanent, but this is the 07 and they have these in different th thicknesses, the fine one sketch, they just redesigned these. So these are now all refillable as well, which is kind of cool. And then they have sort of like this, if you can see, it's like an oval cap. So when you put the cap on, um, it'll only roll so, so far, it sort of resists rolling and it kind of settles. So this is the, the black version of the sketch. They also make it in a variety of other colors. Uh, my favorite, of course, is this teal, which is the same, it's 305. Um, same kind of body and, and stuff. And they have one other that I like to use. And this is where you asked about watercolor. I have not played with water watercolor much, but I like it. So this is uh, the fine one art. So you can see it's got a little brush symbol. And so when I'll just bring this out and let's uh, color my, you know, I've got an orange ocean apparently here. So it's sort of like a, a brush tip. You can see I've run it across some black. So it's got a little black on the tip, but it sort of gives you a, you know, a little more of a brush look to it like this. And what's nice about that is I can make it really bold or I can make it super fine, right? So if I need to get into a, a really tight space, like say I wanna come back in here and fix this up, I can just touch those so if you want sort of a kind of a pseudo watercolor feel, this could be a really good option if you didn't want to carry watercolor stuff around, um, but have some colors that you could take into the field. So that's, this is the, the fine one art. So that's, those are the tools that I tend to use. Um, the one other that I've been using is some kind of a gel pen. So this is um, the Papermate Inkjoy 07. Um, I'd like, all the pens I like to carry have caps on them because I carry them in my pocket and I'm always worried that if I accidentally click it, that it might uh, stain my jeans. So I always like pens with caps on them. And I really like gel pens because they have a nice bold ink and just the flow of them feels really great. So that's really my core tools that I use um, for the most part. Probably the only other thing I can mention that I will use very often um, are two things, uh, probably three. I guess I could probably go all day with these. Uh, good old Papermate flares from junior high school. Um, if you go to Target and you pay attention to the pen aisle, uh, Papermate flares are really popular with bullet journalists. And if you know what bullet journaling is, look that up. But um, this is the go-to tool that I use, the black Papermate flare. It's, a, it's a, also a felt tip pen. It is not waterproof, so it will bleed but it just got such a great feeling, like the balance and everything about it's really great. And now they offer them in colors like orange and other colors and some crazy colors too. So this is another thing. If you wanted to just take pens in the field and not have to take watercolors in the field, you could take Pentel uh, Papermate uh, flare pens. So that's another tool that I like. And then probably the last thing I'll mention is um, some kind of a mechanical pencil. This is a Faber-Castell. Uh, the reason I like this is it's got a really super thick uh, lead. I think that's a 1.4 millimeter and it's really soft. And the reason I like it is I like, well, if I do logo work, I just like having this really smooth, silky, sketchy thing, right? And I can, if I really want to hit it, I can get it super dark. Or if I'm really gentle, I can get a really soft, you know, tip it on an angle, I can get a nice tone. Um, it just 
I just really love soft lead. Now the trade-off is if I rub my hand across it, I'll have lead all over the back of my hand. But for the most part, I'll do a sketch like this, take a photo with my camera. And that's the thing that I might share with a customer or capture as my, as my reference for the idea. So that would be probably, this would be the core tool set that I would use for most of the work that I do that's analog. Oh, that's an amazing collection of tools, Mike. And uh, I love seeing how quickly you can, you can put those things together. And um, I really wanna thank you so much for taking time to join us and, and share your process and sketch notes. Um, I'll post in the final link too. I know your printer press um, kindly gave us a discount code for yep. Peach Fit Press. Um, for a 45% discount on your book. And we've also got um, your sketch note idea book, kind of a journal of yours. And uh, just in closing, I wonder if you can just give a little inspiration for thinking, you know, not even, not only through, you know, more formal meetings, but how people may incorporate these techniques into their mm -hmm. journaling or their, you know, going out in nature and, what elements they can apply because it's not just when we're sitting in a formal environment but everything else that I think all of your techniques still apply. Yeah I'm always kind of experimenting with different applications so you identified a really great one journaling of all kinds right if it's a journal about you know my plague year <laughs> or if it's going out into the field any kind of journaling where you're writing sort of your experiences it can be really helpful to sketch what you're seeing or sketch what you're thinking or even sketch what you're feeling. Um, obviously, you know, meetings, you could do that sort of, when I first did the book, you know, meetings were sort of the core, we knew immediate application. But as I started to explore, you could do it for ideation. So if you have a challenge, and you need to solve a problem, why not get out your pens and sketch and write and solve it on paper before you, uh, before you go out and try things, you can do really fast explorations, either individually or, uh, you know, in a group with uh, ideation sketches. That's a really good application. The other thing I would say are experiences of all kinds. Now you mentioned, you know, nature journaling could be one where you're, ob you're being, uh, ob you're obs observing things. Other experiences to consider would be travel. When you go to a unique place, you just have a really unique perspective. I do travel journals whenever I can. And they really help me remember the experience far better than, I mean, I still take photos and, and so on, but being forced to document what I'm doing. Like when I go back, I remember so much more from sketchnote travel journals that I do than if I just took photos because I'm writing everything down in the order that it happened and it helps me to reconstruct the memories. Uh, and I, a lot of the memories come back more richly. The other one is um, food. And that can take the form of either uh, eating food or it could be making food. So one of the challenges I would say is um, why not do a, do a recipe as a sketch note instead of just writing text down, draw the elements, maybe draw the steps, use the path or the, or the modular with numbers to show the step-by-step -step progression of the recipe coming together. Um, and, you know, there's all kinds of other things. I also uh, love, um, I'm a football fan, so I watch, often watch football games. So sports what you realize when you sketch note sports a lot of times too is there is so much downtime in sports. Football is notorious for timeouts and um, ads and other things that just there's all this downtime where you have, nothing's happening. So you have plenty of time to construct your storyline on a sport that can go for baseball, can go for soccer, any kind of sport that you're looking at. And I think it could be really interesting even as an athlete, if you're a coach, to note down the things you're noticing about your your student that you're guiding, right? Like, well, they in swimming, uh, she tends to throw her arm a little bit odd. So you draw that out and you write some notes. And then when the student comes back out, you sort of sit down and show them what you're seeing, right? Um, and then maybe maybe even take a photo and send it to them so they can study it. So next time in the next session, they can kind of work on that and be aware of it. So possibilities. I think there's a ton of ways to do that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this could just keep going. The, Here's the thing about sketching is I tried to keep it open enough that people could pick it up and apply it in their own settings. And I think that was a really wise choice that I didn't plan on. But I've encountered people like physicists who really have gotten into sketching. I have a physicist friend in Germany 
who basically sketch noted the idea of solar energy and how it works and the limitations. And she's got all this physics stuff like bound into it, like really nerdy physics, you know, equations and stuff, but it's a sketch note. So like a school kid could look at it and at the, at one level, understand it. And if you were another physicist, you could actually get the concept and appreciate all the detail that she put in that maybe passes by other people. So there's so many different ways to apply it and your own unique, your, your own unique voice adds something to it and you can give your own little twist. So I would say ex do a lot of experimentation. I'm, you know, I sort of led with that experiment. Experiment and play. Yeah, absolutely. Try. <laughs> really important, really important. Oh, Mike, you've been so generous with your, your techniques and time. Just thank you again. And, and thank you everyone um, joining us here on the, the Art Toolkit community. And um, I uh, look forward to being in touch. And I know that I'll be a lot more intentional moving forward with my sketch noting. It, it, it's such a neat, really fun way to express ideas. And uh, thank you for sharing that inspiration with all of us. You're welcome. I'm so glad I could be here. And uh ever get to Washington State, I'll look you guys up and you can take me on an expedition. That would be a lot of fun. Oh, absolutely. Well, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and uh, everyone else uh, enjoy the rest of your day as well. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thanks for being here.